Uh, dear students, uh, today we are going to demonstrate the examination of heap. Uh, basically, examination of heap, uh, we are going to assess the function of heap. In general, the function of heap can be tabulated as the walking. Of course, next is the sitting. Then next is a standing. And four is lying down. We are going to demonstrate each of them. Standing, maybe sitting on a chair. And sitting on floor. Uh, standing, maybe single leg stance or single leg standing. And double leg stance or double leg standing. So first of all, let me discuss the walking. Walking or the gait. Abnormality in walking or gait may be because of the pain arising from any fine starting from the heel, ankle, knee, and hip. That is along the weight bearing axis. Or maybe because of weakness of muscles that take part in the gait. Especially, we are focusing today on the muscles around the hip joint. And of course, limb length discrepancy. These are the three basic headings on which the gait can be abnormal. Let me discuss a few classical types of them. The pain is antalgic gait. Like for weakness, we have Trendelenburg gait. Or we have foot drop gait. Or we have we may have spastic gait. Spastic or scissor gait. And there are so many others. Regarding the limb length discrepancy, the common one is short limb gait. Or it may be like sometimes circumduction gait. There are a few many other important gates, but I will discuss on the common one. First come with the antalgy gate. As I said, the antalgy gate arises, gate abnormality is because of pain arising from hip, knee, ankle or heel. So, Whenever there is any source of pain along the weight bearing axis in the lower limb, the patient will have antalgic gait and the patient tries to avoid the bare weight on that limb. Basically, in a, uh, in a gait cycle, we have a stance phase or weight bearing phase and a swing phase and where the weight limb is off the ground. So obviously, the patient try to, ob try to omit weight bearing on that painful limb. That's why the classical feature is of the diminished or decrease stance phase. The stance phase on the ipsilateral side will be diminished on an antalgic gait. Okay. Moreover, in antalgic gait, the patient try to deviate the trunk to the opposite side. Usually, trunk deviate to the other side. These are basically two classical features of antalgic gait. Another one 
is a Trendelenburg gate. In Trendelenburg gate, the ipsilateral abductor mechanism constriction of the fulcrum or the hip joint, the liver arm or the neck of the femur and neck head and the trochanteric area, and the force or abductor muscle that is gluteus medius. There may be discrepancy weakness in any of these three, either fulcrum or liver arm or the power, leading to a trend in the gait. In a training work gait, in the ipsilateral stance phase, in the ipsilateral stance phase, there is the deviation of strong to same side. So I should write here deviation of strong to the same side during the ipsilateral stance phase. In Sense phase because the abductor mechanism is weakened here. So when the other limb is off the ground, the pelvis try to pelvis try to dip down to compensate that for there is the abductor muscles will contract and you know normally the both the pelvis should be level both the a sides should be at the same level, but when the weight, the weight bearing is, is on the pathological side of weakened abductor mechanism, the abductor mechanism is incompetent to bring down the pelvis to the same level. So the patient try to bring the center of gravity to the weight bearing side or debit the trunk to the same side. That means the patient tries to bring the center of gravity towards the weight bearing limb. This is in contrast to analgesic gait where the deviation of trunk day is deviated towards the opposite side or normal side. Trunk deviates towards the normal side in antalgic gait. Trunk deviates towards the abnormal side in Trendelenburg gait. Next is foot drop gait. We know that in a stance phase, the first cycle, first phase of a stance is the heel strike. The heel should strike first on the ground. It should strike first on the ground. So in a foot drop, when the dorsiflexors are weakened or weaker, the heel strike will be absent. And inst after instead of heel strike, the patient will have flat foot as a first step of a stance. Here the dorsal flexors are weakened, so the first phase or that is heel strike will be absent. It will be absent because of weak dorsal flexors. The other feature is that, however, the stance phase will be equal on right side and left side. I mean to say the stance phase will be equal, equal stance phase. This is in contrast with in contrast to the antalgic gait, where the stance fair is diminished. Next is a short limb gait. Short limb gait. In a short limb gait, either the femoral segment or the T of the segment will be shorter in comparison to the normal side. Normally in a walking, there will be some few centimeters, up to one to two centimeters of vertical dipping of the ASI, or I mean pelvis. Normally one to two centimeters of vertical dipping will be there. But in a short limb gait, the vertical dipping of the pelvis will be increased in comparison to other side. So there will be, we may see, Increased vertical dipping of the pelvis or ASIS, I mean, if you are inspecting from the front. Anterior superior iliac spine. This is a short limb gait. Next is the circumduction gait.
in a sorghum reduction gate, there is apparent or maybe true lengthening. Usually, in most of the cases, you will have the patient will have the apparent lengthening of the limb. So, if the one of the limb is lengthened, the patient has, let's say, the patient has to roll to roll the lower limb circularly and bring anterior to clear up the step because the limb is abducted. So, he is like that. This is they has to clear the ground, he has to circumduct the limb. This is because of functional lengthening of the lower limb. Or the pa a patient has to make rotate the circ rotate the limb and anteriorly to forward the step. Next is a scissor gate. In a spastic child, especially with spastic cerebral palsy, the both the adductors of the hip, usually they are spastic. Both the hips are adducted. So they are just crossing each other in a scissor fashion because of excessive spasm of the adductor muscle. So in the child, in such child, the patient has a scissor gate, like they are crossing one of the other, like that. And it is an unstable gate. Usually, the spastic CP of the child will have a scissor gate. So, you will see excess adductor spasm. Usually, you have a spastic CP child. Cerebral palsy. Spastic cerebral palsy. There are a few other abnormal gait patterns are there, like waddling gait. Usually, you have the waddling gait when bilateral there is bilateral CDS, condylar dislocated hip, or you can say DDS, development dysplasia of hip. Both the hips are unstable. There is there is lateral sideways sideways lurching, bilateral sideways lurching will be there, and the patient walks on a broad base. So this is a waddling gait. Sometimes you may see a stiff hip gait. Where the normal few degrees, certain degrees, 10 20 degree of flexion of the hip required for normal gait will be absent. So, in order to compensate for that, there will be excessive lurching at the lumbar spine. The patient compensates by the lurching of, at the lumbar spine to compensate for the loss of flexion of the hip. Stiff hip gait. Similarly, you may have stiff knee gait. There are the ataxic gate or ataxic gate where the lesion is the cerebellum. You may have gluteus maximus gate where the extension of the hip, that's the gluteus maximus is weak. You may have quadriceps large where the quadriceps or the extension of the knee is weak. This is in short about the different types of gait a patient may have in a case of hip. We would like to demonstrate and explain more on another lecture regarding the abnormal, abnormal gaits.